Well, Scott Nickel is my name, and I'm the guy who founded Ibis back in 1981. Well, it started a little bit before that. We would um, convert old, like, Schwinn Ballooner fat tire bikes into multi-geared bikes with cantilever brakes. So we'd braze on some brake braze-ons and put some gears on them, old TA triple cranks, and 26-inch uh, tires, fully rigid, and we would start bombing down hills. I grew up in the East Bay, uh, kind of east of Berkeley, California, and the big birthplace of mountain biking is acknowledged as being in in uh, Marin, which is just across the bay from us, and also in Crested Butte and other places, depending on who you talk to, of course. But there was a lot of simultaneous evolution happening then with with bikes and uh, people figuring out, hey, we can ride these things in the dirt, and it's pretty fun. So what happened was. Uh, I read an article in a magazine called Coevolution Quarterly, and it was written by Charlie Kelly, and he talked about this this new thing where these guys were building these bikes in Marin, and uh, Joe Breeze had just built the first purpose-built mountain bike where he took 4130 tubing and brazed it together and made a mountain bike out of it. So in other words, he didn't just take an old Schwinn frame and retrofit it. He built a, a purpose, the first purpose-built bike. And so this was happening in, you know, 1979, 1980, something like that. And I got wind of this, and so I, I got in touch with, with uh, what was called Mountain Bikes then, run by Gary Fisher and Charlie Kelly. And they said, hey, we're going to Crested Butte, you, you want to go? And so I went with them, and on that trip I met Joe Breeze, I met Steve Potts, I met Tom Ritchie, I met um, Eric Kosky. Uh, and a bunch of other guys who have were in there in the in the early days, Otis Guy, uh, Charlie Cunning, Cunningham, et cetera, et cetera. And so we went to Crested Butte and had a great time. Spent a week there in the in September when the fall colors were kicking in. And when I came back, I asked Joe and I asked Charlie, Joe Breeze and Charlie Cunningham, if I could apprentice with them. So I spent the winter apprenticing and learning how to build frames with both of those guys down in Marin County. And then the next spring, April, I call it April April 1st for the um, anniversary, April Fool's Day, obviously, uh, 1981, that's the day that I, I sort of hung up my shingle and started Ibis and started making my own frames. So I made a, made a frame and somebody said, hey, would you make me one? And I said, sure. And so I made another one. And then it happened again and again and again. And here we are 39 and a half years later, and we're still just making frames for people. So, right. And what was the first <laughs> one called? Well, I just called it Ibis. I didn't want to name the company after me. I wanted to have a different name on it. And uh, birds are light and they fly and they have these, you know, birds, birds have a tremendous amount of freedom. And we do too on bikes. So I wanted to associate it with a bird. And the name Merlin actually was already taken by um, a company over in, uh, over in the UK. I considered Kestrel, that was another name I considered, but I settled on an Ibis uh, because I just liked the way it sounded and the Ibis birds are really beautiful in flight. Uh, unfortunately, they're kind of ugly on the ground and I didn't really do my research that well. They, they look like storks and they're kind of gangly, but they're beautiful in flight. So, <laughs> so, we, so the, the representation of the Ibis on the head badge is the bird in flight, not the gangly bird on the shore. So anyway, I uh, started the company named, named Ibis and I just put, the, you know, put a little logo on the down tube and, um, and that was that. And gradually we started to get better graphics and an actual logo and things like that. And, and um, there was no model name back then, it was just an Ibis. And so it, we continued for several years with, with no model names and just a custom bike made for each individual person. And I think it was probably 86, five years later, before we actually started making different models of bikes. We would make some tandem bikes, we made some cross bikes, we made some uh, trials bikes, and um, it was still pre-suspension, so we were just making steel hardtail mountain bikes was our predominant bit of business that we did for that first mm, five to eight years, I would say. That's awesome. And you said when you first started off, it was word of mouth, friends. Uh, what was like the pivotal moment when things really started to pick up? I think 
um, you, you know, we got we got visits from Suntour and Shimano and even Campagnolo. Valentino Campagnolo came over to visit us in the in the late '80s, and they were taking a very serious interest in this. They never really went went very far with it, but it was pretty it was pretty special to have the the CEOs of all these companies come over and visit little old Ibis, and then you know they'd visit Car Charlie and Joe and Gary Fisher and all these guys, and um, they. The, I think that was a moment when the world was sitting up and taking notice and going, oh, this is, this is a real thing. And of course, you know, we had people like Mike Senior to specialized mass, you know, bringing it to the mass market more and um, really making it, uh, giving it the foundation for the worldwide s s phenomenon that it is now. Yeah. And was there a certain model that really exploded the brand? One of the, one of my favorites was just the steel mojo that we had starting in about 93 or 94. Just a classic, elegant bike. You know, you look back on stuff that you've done over the over a 40 year time span and there's a few things that you kind of like just hide your head and go, oh boy, what was I thinking there? But the mojo, that was a bike that I'm really proud of and I look at today. I have, I still have one. And um, of course it doesn't ride anywhere near what the new bikes ride like, but it's a, it's a great bike. Um, it was it was a great bike for the time, and um, that that was um, that was one I'm really proud of. Another one was the Titanium Mojo. We did we had a project we worked with Ancotech Titanium back in Detroit, and Gary Helfrick, the guy who founded um, Merlin Metalworks, brilliant uh, designer, and we made butted titanium tubing, which had never been done before. And those were those are really cool bikes too. They're super super light for for what they were at the time, uh, in the mid early to mid '90s, uh, building these beautiful beautiful titanium frames. And that was right. So that was still a hardtail, but but that was right after Rockshock came about in around 1990, and we started at least getting front suspension. Um, and for the most part, that was you know there was one or there was a couple little. Uh, forays into rear suspension, but nothing that was very exciting until quite a bit later with the Horst Link, um, you know, Specialized Hat licensed it, but originally it was Horst Leitner and the, and the amp bikes. And that's when things started to get pretty sophisticated in the rear suspension and they were, they were building bikes that were actually really efficient pedaling, but also had great shock absorbing capacity. Yeah, and when was your guys' first full suspension on the market and how was that whole ordeal? We hooked up with a guy named John Castellano and he uh, worked with us to build a bike called the Zazbo and it was uh, an aluminum bike and it had a single pivot and it um, the whole rear end moved. It was called the Unified Rear Triangle. It's, it's, it fell out of favor pretty fast, but it had five inches of rear wheel travel, and it was a, it was it was a really fun bike, and it, it definitely um, accelerated the, the development of of rear suspension. We then also did the bow tie with John, which is also a five inch travel titanium bike that had no pivots. It just had these things we call bow stays that that moved the whole stay moved five inches. The, the or the rear wheel travel was five inches, and it bent over the entire length of the bow stay, which is about 39 inches long. And that was a, that was a really remarkable piece of technology that, uh, that John came up with. And then that, that pivotless technology moved into some soft tails that we built with about one and three quarters of inch, inches of travel called the silk tie. And, um, and actually after we made the silk tie for a while, we did the, the uh, aluminum frame, the first Ripley, the r first Ripley was made back in 2000, and that was a, a pivotless soft tail that had a one and three, one and a quarter inches of travel in the rear. And, um, and it wasn't really until Ibis V2, which is a long story, but around 2003, we started development of the carbon fiber Mojo, which had 140 mils of rear, rear wheel travel and operated with a DW link suspension. And that was a carbon fiber bike front and rear. So completely different than anything we'd ever done before. Yeah, and you mentioned the Ibis V2. Uh, what happened around that era and how did that come to be? So around 2000, I sold the company for a minute 
And um, the people I sold it to managed to drive it into bankruptcy within um, 20 months. So we, so I'd, I'd had run it for 20 years, and then in 20 months, they uh, ran it into the ground. And the same, right when that was happening, uh, Hans Heim, who is uh, our current CEO at Ibis, uh, approached me. He had just left Santa Cruz. He was um, he was about a 50% partner in Santa Cruz, and before that, he was a partner in Bontrager. Before that, he was one of the earliest employees of Specialized. So Hans has an incredibly long history in the bike industry, and every project he's ever done has been phenomenally successful. So Hans approached me and said, hey, what's happening with Ibis, with the trademarks and, and everything? Uh, through this bankruptcy and and we you know I told him and we formulated a plan and he engineered um, a way to get the trademarks and we brought um, we just made we made the creditors whole uh, and got the trademarks back and um, really no tooling or anything like that because we were switching from doing metal bikes to doing carbon bikes so uh, Hans had a non-compete because he had just left Santa Cruz, so we had this really nice three-year window to, to develop the first mojo, the first carbon fiber mojo, right? It's the second mojo actually, but the first carbon fiber mojo. And that, um, so we so we formed Ibis V2 basically, and that was Hans and myself and Tom Morgan was brought in as president, and Roxy Lowe was brought in as our designer. And then shortly after that, Colin Hughes, um, who's our lead engineer to this day, uh, became part of the company. So there's five people who are in the company. Um, we don't have any uh, shareholders or any outside investors or anything like that. We all five work in the company every single day. And uh, it's like, you know, it's, it's definitely a rider owned company. Um, just the five of us, Hans, myself, Tom, Roxy, and Colin. The first Carbon Mojo uh, came out in 2005. And it really broke the mold because Prior to that, bikes were um, pretty much form follows function. So you had bikes designed by engineers. They built a lot of triang. They built them with triangles because triangles are really strong. Nothing wrong with triangles, but um, <clears throat> the bikes weren't that aesthetically interesting. So Hans had the idea that we can build carbon fiber monocoque frames, which allows allows you to have a lot of design latitude. And as Hans said, you're not really subject to the tyranny of tubes anymore because bikes to that point had been made pretty much with tubing. And so with carbon fiber, you can make a very organic frame. You can make it very beautiful and have swoopy lines and um, not, be, not just have to be welding tubes together because the carbon fiber frames come out of a mold. So, so Hans uh, hired Roxy to do the design on these frames and it started out as a 2D sketch, you know, just a freehand sketch and uh, came up with a design that was uh, that seemed really good in two dimensions and then we brought it into the CAD program and this, you know, this is 20 years ago or 18 years ago, 2002, so it was definitely the, the CAD programs weren't as sophisticated as they are today. So the first Mojo had 2,000 hours of CAD time into it. Uh, to bring Roxy's 2D drawings into three dimensions and then do everything we needed to do to make room for shock absorbers and derailers and tire clearance and cranks, triple cranks back then and, and all of that. So the other gamble that we took was that people would accept carbon fiber as a material to build a mountain bike out of. And bear in mind, people weren't doing it back then. They're, all, the, all the mountain bikes were made out of metal. And so we had a really, we had kind of a big mountain to, to cross to, to convince people that carbon was an okay material to build mountain bikes with. And one of the things we did is we hired Brian Lopes to ride for us on these early bikes. And you know, he was doing 35 foot gaps and things like this and people like, oh, okay. Looks like maybe they are strong enough. And so <clears throat> fortunately carbon fiber got accepted. People started making carbon fiber frames all over the place and of course now it is the standard uh, very few people question it anymore if you had to predict what an ibis looks like 15 years from now <laughs> what do you see coming or is it one of those things that you guys didn't even see the ritmo 
30 years ago. No, we didn't see any of this stuff 30, I mean, even 10 years ago, it's like, you know, all these new technologies, the carbon fiber is getting better and better. Um, suspension obviously is getting incredible. I think the biggest, the biggest sort of like leaps and bounds improvements in technology that I have seen in the last, let's say five years are uh, tubeless technology, tire technology, carbon fiber rims, lightweight wheels. Um, you know, you, when you look for, I don't know what the bikes are going to look like in, in, in 15 years, but they're, we're not going to break chains. We're not going to have flats. Um, the suspension is going to be incredible. It's going to adapt to your, to your terrain. Um, the bikes are going to be lighter and stronger than ever. You're not going to probably not going to break a frame. Um, there will probably be some pretty sophisticated electronics in them. Um, who knows? Maybe we'll be able to shift by just thinking about shifting. Um, <laughs> so they're, they're, you know, technology is moving so fast. I, 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 I feel like I'd be foolish to kind of try and predict what the bike is going to look like. My hope is that we're still going to be pedaling uphill and earning our turns and, and, you know, have, having bikes that are, that are a joy to ride. I mean, they certainly are now, but back in, 1994 when that mojo came out those were a joy to ride and i was like thinking to myself how are we going to possibly improve on this and of course over that last 25 years 26 years bikes have made incredible changes in their in their technology